Good evening. I want to take care of a little housekeeping before I jump in. Uh, first of all, if you have a phone on you, please put it on mute. And if you're in a Zoom screen, please put it on mute. We would really appreciate that. And if you're interested in receiving AIA CEU credits, please uh, write CE at the BAC.edu. That will be in the chat for those people who need that. OK. Good evening, and welcome to the highlight of the spring lecture series, the Cashieri Lecture in the Humanities. And it is being given by the distinguished Dr. Lee Pelton. Let's see if I'm, all right. I'm in sync now. My name is Karen Nelson. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture. And we're at the Boston Architectural College. And for those of you who are new to the college, we have dynamic programs. Uh, undergraduate and graduate in landscape architecture, interior architecture, design studies, and architecture. Um, we are dedicated to creating more just futures. The college was founded in 1889 as a place of conversation. We continue to bring new energy to that conversation about design, about equitable access, and about the city. The Kashiri Lectureship in the Humanities was established in 1992 to honor the life and work of Archangelo Kashiri, who served the college and its students for more than five decades. He transformed the BAC from club into a remarkable institution. Dean Kashiri was a teacher, a mentor, a leader, an ecclesiastical sculptor. Here you can see student work of his from the 1920s him working as a sculptor, oops, interacting with students about a physical model site design. And many of you have seen this in the BAC's library, also made by Archangelo. He emigrated from Italy when he was five, and he became a student at the BAC in the 1920s, and he became dean in 1943. The lectureship began as a birthday gift to him on his 90th birthday. The inaugural lecture took place in this very room 30 years ago. And it is available on our YouTube site. You can watch H. Morse Payne and the dean uh, blow out his birthday candles. I'm so honored to have such a profound thinker join us for the 30th Cachere Lecture. I want to express my gratitude to Dr. Lee Pelton for his profound thinking and sharing that with us, and also for the incredible work that he's doing with the Boston Foundation throughout Massachusetts to bring equity to communities. I also want to express my gratitude to BAC community members who helped keep this lecture alive. And those are Bernie Goba, Don Brown, and alum Tony Pina. Uh, they have really been a part of the community, making sure that we never forgot the dean and continuing to keep the dean's memory alive. I want to invite President Mahesh Das to help introduce his esteemed colleague, Dr. Lee Pelton. So thank you for joining us. My name is Mahesh Das, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Boston Architectural College. I am so pleased. This uh, has been a great occasion for us to come together and uh, celebrate uh, the 30th, uh, shall we say, 30th lecture in this series of this uh, great lecture series. Uh, I'd like to call us really Boston's Architectural College because since 1889, for 132 years, uh, we have been serving as a foundation of the design disciplines and professions that play an important role in designing and building the urban environments in Boston and New England region and beyond. Social justice, access to excellence in design education, and diversifying the monochromatic design professions have been at the heart of our distinctive mission ever since our founding days. 
The BAC stands among the most diverse design institutions in the country, providing opportunities for a wide range of underrepresented, underprivileged, uh, and otherwise disadvantaged people of our society. Our partnership, uh, many partnerships indeed, with K through 12 schools uh, in the area of early college education, our partnerships with uh, public and private sector employers uh, in the professions and beyond through our work and practice integrated educational model and our partnership with the cities, communities, and municipalities uh, through our BAC Gateway program uh, all serve as transformative civic engagement models. So I call us the great banyan tree of Boston for the partnership-based presence in Boston and across the world, because all of our partners serve as a prop roots for this great institution. So I'm proud of our commitment uh, that our students, faculty, staff, trustees, alumni, and friends make, and for their dedication in advancing our mission and uh, realizing our back to the future, BAC to the future, vision and strategic plan. So given our commitment to social justice through design, education, and service, it should come as no surprise that we have invited Dr. Lee Pelton, CEO and President of the Boston Foundation, a scholar of the humanities and a champion of social justice to deliver the 30th cashier lectureship in the humanities. I'm so grateful that he immediately and graciously accepted our invitation. Uh, now, a little bit about Dr. Pelton, who needs no introduction, but let me go over some of the highlights of his life and career so far. Dr. Lee Pelton is a CEO and president of the Boston Foundation, one of the nation's leading philanthropic organizations with $1.7 billion in assets. He joined the foundation in June 2021 after serving as a president of Emerson College and uh, before that at Willamette University from 1998 to 2011. Dr. Pelton began his academic career at Harvard University where he earned a PhD in English literature with uh, an academic focus on 19th century British prose and poetry. He taught English and American literature at Harvard and served as senior tutor at Winthrop House. He later served on the Harvard Board of Overseers and as vice chair of its executive committee. And uh, after Harvard, Dr. Pelton served as dean of the college at Colgate University and at Dartmouth University as well. A well-respected thought and innovation leader, Dr. Pelton was named as a living legend by the Boston Museum of uh, African American History in 2021 and inducted by the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce into its Academy of Distinguished Bostonians in 2020. He's also received the Leader of Change Award from Trinity Boston Connects in 2021, Governor's Award from Mass Humanities in 2020, and the Robert Cord Distinguished Leadership Medal in 2021. He was also honored by the EOS Foundation with a $100,000 racial justice grant in his name in 2020. He's also served on the board of directors of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce on a variety of committees and on the board of trustees of the public media pioneer GBH as executive finance and compensation committees. And also on the Barr Foundation, one of the nation's leading philanthropic organizations with more than $3 billion in assets. On a personal note, Dr. Pelton and I share some part of our geographical journeys. He
He grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and resides now in Boston, obviously. And one of my degrees uh, was from Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, the Little Apple. <laughs> and I previously worked as a dean at uh, the University of Kansas before coming to Boston, obviously. So I'm so glad and privileged that we could share those journeys, Dr. Pelton. And uh, he and I both believe in the dictum of ad astra per aspera, which means through hard work, our aspirations take us to stars. So, uh, and he has been a trusted advisor for me uh, throughout our visioning and strategic planning process. Uh, he was a great colleague and a fellow president on the Pro Arts Consortium. And particularly during the time of the pandemic, his advice uh, and camaraderie has been incredible. So it gives me immense pleasure to award him the medal of the Cashieri Lectureship in the Humanities, a distinguished fellowship that includes 29 uh, extraordinary speakers before this time. So Dr. Pelton, may I invite you to the podium, please? There's please. Actual, there's an actual medal. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 I didn't know that this gig came with a bling, but uh, I'll take it. I'll take it and wear it proudly. Hey, listen, Mahesh, thank you so much. And Dean, thank you so much for those uh, wonderful and kind words. Whenever I hear that, uh, I'm a living legend. I think quietly to myself that it's better than the alternative. <laughs> so, yes, it is uh, indeed. Um, you know, th there's a uh, definition of a college president as someone who lives in a big house and begs for money. Uh, so I've been doing that all my life. And it's really wonderful to be on the other side of that equation uh, at an organization with $1.7 billion of assets, which I happily get to give away each year, uh, although you can't imagine how many people want to have lunch with me now. So, <laughs> so uh, let me say thank you for inviting me to say a few words uh, today. I am uh, deeply grateful uh, and humbled by the opportunity, though I must say that uh, I'm not sure why I was even invited, given that my academic interests lie not in uh, designing or creating spaces, but rather in constructing uh, and creating meaning out of literary uh, history and its many artifacts of poetry and prose. As you well know, the Boston Arch Architectural College, the college, the progenitor of your college, I should say the club, was envisioned as a broad community, not just for architects, but also for sculptors and painters and decorative artists and patrons of the arts. And from its earliest days, the club and the college wished to make its programs open and inclusive, an essential value that has endured for more than 130 years, and I applaud you for that. I know, for instance, that students are required to commit several hours in communities, and your education might be properly described as anti-hubris uh, and committed uh, to the common good. And I do not believe it would be an exaggeration, and I mean this sincerely, to say that your college represents the very best of what it means to be truly educated. And it's integration of practice, community, and study in a variety of architectural fields. Equally impressive is how BAC's mission is aligned with this grand experiment that we call America, a commonwealth of diverse interests and people who taken together are in an idealized sense an expression of our common humanity. Uh, but when one digs a little deeper, one discovers that there is, in fact, maybe, a link between your field and mine, between architecture and literature, as expressed in Walt Whitman's justly famous poem, I Hear America Singing. And so I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to sing this song to you, not literally, but uh, I'm going to sing this, uh, these, these verses to you. It begins, I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be blithe and strong. 
the carpenter singing his, and he, as he measures his plank or beam, the mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work, the boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat, the deckhand singing on the steamboat deck, the shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench, the hatter singing as he stands, the woodcutter's song, the plowboy on his way in the morning or at noon intermission or at sundown, the delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work or of the girl sewing or washing, each, each singing what belongs to him or her and to no one else, the day that belongs to the day at night, the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. Now, of course, this was uh, in 1856, and the use of pronouns <laughs> must sound very antiquated to us uh, today. Uh, but I'm only uh, repeating uh, what Whitman wrote. This is a poem about the musicality of making and doing. It's a poem about design in the service of a romanticized, idyllic community. It's about democratic idealism embodied in the working class. It has been variously interpreted as signifying variegated aspects of human life and human endeavor. Liberation, laborers, working class folks, freedom, growth, dignity, or progress. Some have argued that Whitman is commenting on the way that individuals work together to create something greater than themselves when he says he hears America singing. The individuals are all part of America, and each contributes in their own uni unique way to it. In fact, Whitman called America the greatest poem. And one scholar wrote that Whitman believed that the power of poetry and democracy came from an ability to make a unified whole out of disparate parts. The notion that the fate of each one of us is tied to the fate of all of us is the essence of democracy, and that is contained in his poetry. In the broadest sense, architects, planners, designers, and poets are all makers. So as one writer suggested, it comes as no surprise that architecture was a favorite trope in Whitman's poetry. And some of America's most innovative architects took particular inspiration from Whitman and his work. His journalism included architectural critiques, mostly churches and public buildings. Another wrote that his preference for simplicity and the welfare of the common people meant that housing was a point of interest for him. As such, he was invested in domestic architecture that provided a good standard of living without becoming overbuilt or expensive. Keep going, please. The great mass of the poor live in insufficient tenements, he wrote uh, in an essay called Wicked Architecture, published by Life Illustrated in 18. 56. He said that's because the competition on the narrow island for dwelling places is so keen that dwellings both cheap and nasty, to use an expressive late English Saxonism, he says, pay large rents, and if the landlords get their rent, what matter whether the house be a house or a sty? And the poor tenants, knowing that landlords can always find occupants, and consequently not being able to, to coerce improvement by threatening to remove, must live in such dens as they may. He went on, on to say that in no other city in the whole world does rent occupy so large a proportion of expenses as in New York. And in no other city in the world would so many years income be required from the man of whatsoever Improvised, improvised and social standing to purchase for himself a piece of ground and a house whereon and wherein to live. Obviously, this is a poet who did not live in Boston. So, so far, so good. However, when one considers what is absent from this most American of 
American poems about the young nation's historic temper. It is its democratic idealism, and one notes that an essential and defining aspect of Whitman's America is absent. Consider that a year following the, public, the publication of I Hear America Singing in 1860, a dark shadow was cast over Whitman's democratic vista, a civil war, in which 3% of the American population gave their lives, a war whose cost in American lives was as great as in all of the nation's other wars combined through the Vietnam War a century later. There is no mention in Whitman's poem of the slave labor on which America was built. On the eve of the Civil War in 1860, four million, four million of the 32 million uh, Americans, almost 15% of the population were enslaved black people, mostly but not exclusively in the South. 15% of Americans are nowhere to be seen in this human-centered and community-centered poem or in his humanistic essays. They are, as they often are in American chronicles about American exceptionalism, erased, nowhere to be found. In this sense, Whitman's promise of America is incomplete despite its idealistic strivings. And while Whitman professed himself as opposed to slavery, one is startled by the disconnection between his idealized view of American life and the sheer brutality of slavery, the most undemocratic and horrific aspect of American democracy. African Americans have spent more time in slavery than they have in, in, in emancipation. It will take almost a century almost a century before that equation is reversed. It is one thing to embrace anti-slavery in the abstract or even write about it, as he did, but it is quite another to acknowledge its unimaginable despotic and violence and brutality. And so I'm here to say to you today, to remind you, particularly the students, because I know that you already know it in your head to remind you to feel in your heart, in the air you breathe, in your imagination, in your planning, in your designing, that your work is deeply human. Your work is not about design merely. It's not about pretty edifices merely. And you know that. Your work is deeply humanistic. And it must be self-consciously inclusive. And without the latter, the former is not possible. Humanistic design, or what some call democratic design, is not an add-on, but rather it is central and essential to what you do and how you do it. It is about excellence, and excellence is not about being something, but rather it's about becoming something, and as such, it is always evolving and subject to continuous improvement. I dare say that too much of architecture, especially urban planning, fails to do the very hard work of looking beneath the surface of things to ensure that diverse voices and lived experiences are fully and permanently represented. This work is especially people-centric, and it is obliged to bear witness to the people who inhabit and commune now and into the future in the spaces they create to see them not in the abstract, but as individuals with distinctive cultures, languages, and histories. You know, our lifelong project is, simply put, the process by which we begin to deepen our connection to the world around us, the process of comprehending the profound connectivity of the individual self to all that lies outside of the self. This is really what it means to be human. For instance, we recognize that as individuals, we live in a universe that operates according to natural laws, some of which are known, many of which are not, and none of which are under our control. The individual is also connected to the earth and the environment that sustains life. We have sought to understand more completely our connection 
to our biologic selves in ways that have transformed and challenged our concepts of self and family and community. And closely related is our comprehension of how we behave and how we react to various forms of stimuli, those that are present in the natural world, as well as those that are present in genetic codes. Every individual interacts habitually with the outward expressions of aesthetic and cultural forms in the visual and performing arts, as well as in literature and, of course, in architecture. We recognize from an early age and most self-consciously as adults that we are connected to social, economic, and political structures, some more visible than others, that shape societies, that shape nations and governments. It seems almost innately human for individuals or groups to imbue human experience with meaning and symbolic representation through religious or even secular humanistic thought. In this sense, all branches of knowledge, including your own, are humanistic. And I dare say that architecture, in fact, is the most humanistic of disciplines because it connects the individual self to all that lies outside of the self. Now, you all know that architecture is not simply about bricks and mortar. It's not about these beautiful edifices that I referred to earlier that you design and create. These are only the forms. These are only the structures with which humans engage and interact. The promise of architecture, writ large, is to give increased focus to how we engage and interact with each other, how we understand and contemplate the created world, how we live, how we recreate, how we conduct our commerce, how we love and where we have lovers, how we have families, how we make and have friends. Put simply, it gives increased focus to who we are and what we hope to be. I'm going to make this very bold claim that architecture is the most life-affirming occupation on Earth and that it has no peer. But if you are to fulfill your trust to the world in which you and others live, then you cannot turn your backs to the nation's wants and problems because you are part of that involuntary palpitating life and you cannot, you cannot look out on it from your luxurious shelter as mere spectators, or hide your eyes in selfish complaining. You know, as you well know, the term equity, we hear it everywhere these days, has been increasingly used since the May 2020 murder of George Floyd and the ensuing public exposure of the systemic racial, social, and economic disparities that have long plagued our country. Yet it is not commonly understood. For some people, and perhaps for many, it's mistakenly used as a substitute for the equivalent or the concept of equality. You know, equity is sort of more equality piled on each other. Equality and equity are related, but they are very different concepts. And simply put, the former refers to equal inputs. The latter refers to equal outputs. The distinction between equality and equity is significant. For instance, when we're debating or discussing public K through 12 school funding, equality would mean that we ensure that all the schools have equal resources per pupil. On the other hand, advocating for equity would mean recognizing that some schools like those and serving students in low income communities of color will perforce require more resources if our aim is to reduce or even eliminate educational disparities because our aim is to create equal outputs, not inputs. Racial and social and economic inequities are systemic. They have an accumulated history and have impacted many cultures, many races, and many groups. And because these inequities are structural and commonplace and forged over decades, even centuries, it will require patience generosity and time to disassemble them. Systemic and structural inequities are invisible to most Americans, but certainly not to those generations of Americans who have endured their horrific and damaging impacts. 
You know, at the Boston Foundation, we say that equity means that the structural and underlying causes of outcome disparities are eliminated, or are eliminated for historically marginalized communities. Our equity work requires us to de develop new pathways that repair and build. And repair means addressing and owning up to the critical factors responsible for the continued production of racialized economic and gender disparities and opportunity gaps. At the Boston Foundation, we acknowledge that repairing the threadbare social fabric in our society is one of the most pressing issues of our time. And build means to seek to erect new social and economic structures and policies that in turn create new habits of being that contribute to a just and equitable society. To the students, I want to say you have an opportunity. I would argue that you have the obligation to do this work as well, to acknowledge the harm done, to seek to repair, and to build new structures and designs and planning that create a more perfect union, a more just and democratic America. I urge you, when and wherever you can, to see your work as something much larger than yourself, to see your work as part of the American democratic enterprise. Professor Jan Wampler, who is the emeritus professor in MIT's Department of Architecture and Planning, whose interests are understanding and designing of spaces between buildings, as well as buildings that can respond to people's needs. In a review of his MIT exhibition called Open Strings for E, Search on the Journey, he was, in fact, called the Walt Whitman of architects. He is sometimes called the people's architect. And he once said in an interview in 2008, he said, architects are usually in the back seat of the economic world. Developers tell us to design something, and we do so without question. Architects or urban designers should be the people looking out for the physical environment. But we have a greater responsibility than just the economics, and as such, we should be more outspoken about what is being built. The new architect of the future has to be a more outspoken and creative leader who is considerably more involved in all decisions that might affect our built environment. He went on to say that governments should be relying on our collective wisdom as much as builders rely on our technical expertise. We haven't gotten to that point yet, but it should be our goal. So how does one build communities out of groups of strangers, one author wrote? Well, people must see each other as allies and equals, not in hierarchical relationship. Doing so upends and interrupts the status quo and our notion of what is normal or normative. Some have suggested that for an urban design to be democratic, it must empower and acknowledge the users of the urban environment, be they the intended users or not. This is rare. For it to be a true democratic design, the voices of both the invisible and invisible communities must be taken into account. Urban design and planning in particular must not only be democratic, but humanistic. It has an obligation to empower all of the users, not just a privileged few. And above all, it must take into account and acknowledge not only the visible voices and lived experiences, that's an easy thing to do, but the invisible voices and invisible lived experience, which is a much more difficult thing to do. As an example, when I was president of Emerson College, I led the college in Boston in a multi-year project to revitalize the downtown corridor adjacent to the Boston Common. The big idea was to transform our Boston Common, our, we called our campus on the Common, as, and as we called it, in the downtown to enliven the Boston and Tremont Street corridor, to make it a destination, a crossroad for all who lived work, visit, and studied in Boston, to create a sense of place that would embrace the increasing diversity of our city. And one of the most visible 
signs of this transformation was the complete overhaul of the little building, which sits on the corner of Boylston and Tremont Streets. We could have demolished it and saved a lot of money. But while it would have done that, it would have destroyed the building's splendid, celebrated, and glorious history. And the renovated little building was a stunning achievement, both inside and out. The little building's occupancy was increased almost 30%, allowing us to house all three undergraduate classes on campus, which we believed would enliven and strengthen undergraduate academic and intellectual experience, as well as, and this is equally important, as well as freeing up more affordable housing for Bostonians. The, Boyl the Boylston streetscape improvements included widening, widening the sidewalks, uh, converting Boy Boylston Street from Charles Street to Essex from a two-way to a one-way street to slow down the traffic and to create a bike lane, and creating what we hoped would be gathering and socializing spaces with benches and plantings and wayfinding signage for visitors to Emerson and to Boston. And the little building, like several of our renovations during my 10 years at Emerson, have won architectural awards because of their ambition to reclaim and reimagine buildings rather than demolishing and erasing their cultural history. However, one aspect of our planning design continues to haunt me. Our campus on the Common was proximate to the St. Francis House whose mission, according to its website, is to rebuild lives by providing refuge and pathways to, uh, to stability for adults experiencing homelessness and poverty. St. Francis House is a welcoming and inclusive community. Every day of the year, it enables individuals to meet their basic needs for food, for clothing, and shelter. It transforms lives using a holistic approach to understanding and addressing behavioral health, housing, and employment needs. But one of the design features was to create benches that would not allow people to lie down in order to prevent our unhoused neighbors, most of whom were connected to St. Francis House, from sleeping overnight or during the daytime on those benches. So the question it raised for me is this. To whom does the city belong? Does it belong only to the housed? And how do we or should we navigate the two competing but compelling needs to create a safe environment for our students, faculty, and others who will be attracted to the new amenities there versus making it a safe space for the unhoused? especially those that avoid local homeless shelters because the occupants do not consider them safe. These people are nameless and invisible to most of us. We walk around and sometimes over them every day. But does the city also belong to them? Who has the right to a city? Hostile architecture makes the city inherently unwelcoming to the poor or to the unhoused, but they are also residents of the city. What does democratic design really mean? Should it be designed so that everyone has equal access to it? The question to ask before engaging a project would be this. Who gets benefited and whom does it exclude? Most, if not all of you, are aware of America's history of discriminatory housing and zoning planning practices, many of which were legal and sanctioned by governments, but all of which contributed to an enormous racial wealth gap that continues to grow today. Covenants barred either specific races or everyone other than the Caucasian race from owning, from occupying, from renting, from selling, or even couldn't in inherit any building or lot in specific areas. Redlining that graded neighborhoods based on their potential mortgage lending risks were tied, as we all know, explicitly to race. What many of us don't know is that redlining still exists. 
There's a project that analyzed the demographics of 138 metropolitan areas whose maps showed that nearly all formerly red line zones were still disproportionately black, Latinx, or Asian, while two thirds of the formerly green line zones, if we can call them that, were still majority white. As one author notes, the legacy of redlining extends beyond housing segregation. Red line neighborhoods have worse access to health care, poor educational opportunities, and an increased risk of climate change because many of these areas are prone to flooding or extreme heat. Here's an excerpt from a not yet published uh, TBF op-ed. The historical barriers that made home ownership nearly impossible for people of color in Boston and beyond have left a difficult legacy. Today, blacks are about half as likely as whites to own homes in metropolitan Boston, losing a critical opportunity to build wealth and security through home equity. Even beyond the ample evidence that racism plays a role in decisions about home financing, non-white home buyers lack savings, they face steeper odds for loan approvals and worse entry late, uh, interest rates than whites. And research shows that those with homes trying to sell or upgrade face lower home appraisals than whites. Inequities in home ownership also affect non-white small businesses. In 2021, a report called The Color of Capital Gap the authors traced a direct connection between the historical challenges that have kept people of color from home ownership and the challenges facing minority-owned businesses. Unable to tap home equity as collateral, and entrepreneurs of color receive less favorable loan terms. With poor, with poor loan terms, they face greater pressure to manage their debts than their white peers. And with fewer historic banking relationships, since banks operate in greater concentration in communities with more robust equity systems, they have fewer options to find competitive financing. Add that to the evidence of real racial differences in the treatment of white and non-white borrowers, and the wealth gap feeds upon itself. But here's the thing. Erasing the gap is worth it for all of us. By one estimate, eliminating the racial wealth gap has cost the American economy $16 trillion over the last 20 years. Closer to home, the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation estimated that closing racial wealth gaps in our commonwealth could raise the state GDP by $25 billion over the next five years. In short, it's an investment worth making. Closing the gap means more money in the system for everyone, regardless of race or ethnicity. It is a needed element of a broader strategy, led by public and private entities, as well as socially conscious urban designers and planners and developers to evolve our knowledge and understanding of racism, racism and racist structures, and then imagine, develop, and implement the best policies and programmatic solutions to do away with them. And let's not forget urban renewal. As you may recall, the Housing Act of 1949 set aside significant financing for cities to build public housing and to demolish neglected, overcrowded neighborhoods and antiquated or abandoned industrial properties. As one author points out, the initial purpose of urban renewal programs was to use New Deal works programs to address cities' debt. And federal leaders struck on the idea of using urban renewal to harness an ad hoc redevelopment of cities and turn it into a more coherent national program of planning and redevelopment and housing. And in the mid 20th century, from 1949 to the mid 70s, city governments funded by the federal government demolished hundreds of black neighborhoods in the name of urban renewal. And while black Americans were 10% of the population in 1961, 
they comprised at least 66% of those displaced. And just as damaging was the loss of community and the feeling of rootedness, one 1965 federal report found that non-whites have been forced into already crowded housing facilities, thereby spreading blight, aggra aggravating what we then called ghettos, and generally defeating the social purpose of urban renewal. Displaced citizens, another report founded, are faced with having to reconstruct their lives. They must terminate relationships and break routines that, especially for the elderly, have been equated with life itself. So urban renewal often led to further decline in neighborhoods, just the opposite of what was hoped for. Projects took many years to complete and leading to empty boarded up buildings and leading to increases in area crime. And city officials often deliberately allowed targeted properties to fall into decay with the aim of purchasing them for a cheaper rate. And while people of color were across the board disproportionately affected, poor and working class white families and other groups with fewer resources were also devastated, while middle class, middle class residents were able to block or modify redevelopment plans for their neighborhoods. So in closing, I want to tell you a story. It's my story. In 1954, when the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board of Education that segregated schools were unconstitutional. I was a four-year-old kid from a poor working class family in Wichita, Kansas. I would enter kindergarten in the fall. I lived on a street that divided two distinct neighborhoods, poor and African Americans to the south and middle class whites to the north. Many of the homes in the African American neighborhood were what we called shotgun houses. That is, standing on the front yard with the front and back doors open, you could fire a shotgun clean through them to the backyard. And most of the kids in this part of my neighborhood came from families of laborers, like my father, who worked as a butcher at a meatpacking plant. And like my mother and my grandmother, who cleaned houses for middle class and rich white families. My great-grandparents made a meager living as sharecroppers near Little Rock, Arkansas, where important civil rights battles over the soul and dignity of this nation were waged. My father, after having worked in that meatpacking plant, co-invested with his brother in a gas station in the early 60s, and he finally gained sole ownership. I started working at my father's gas station when I was 14 years old. The gas station was located across town in the black neighborhood in northeast Wichita, while we lived in the mostly white north side of town several miles away. My father's gas station was on the corner of a thriving black business district that included the only black doctor, Dr. Brown, the only black dentist, and the only black own pharmacy, Turner's Pharmacy, all of whom my family and most black families patronize. And I must tell you that Turner's Pharmacy made the best chili cheese hot dogs in the world. The neighborhood also included the only movie theater that catered to black Wichitaans and a black barbershop, a place where politics, Sports, music, gossip, playing the dozens were loudly debated and discussed. And the barbershop especially was rapturous for a young boy like me. You know, I went there every Saturday morning to get a haircut, but more important, I, got, I went there to learn about local and national events in my own black culture and my own black heritage. It was a raft boat of sorts in an unsettled sea. It was a racial refuge for a young boy mostly cut off from black traditions and habits of being. I went to the black YMCA there. I ate at black cafes and restaurants, and some of my best childhood friends lived there. Adam's Barbecue, whose ribs were succulent and sweet and spicy, attracted customers black and white 
from all parts of Wichita, rich and poor. On February 28, 1969, my father received notice that the remaining construction of Interstate I-235, a component of the interstate highway system to be built in Wichita, would be constructed through this neighborhood. There was no pre-planning process that involved the people whose lives and livelihoods would be uprooted by its construction. My father was forced to close his business on short notice. He received no recompense because he didn't own the land. It was actually Mr. Bell, the black owner of the liquor store and cafe adjacent to my dad's gas station. He owned the land. The elevated portion of the bypass, as we called it even today, killed the vibrancy of the neighborhood as it lay waste to the remaining businesses, cultural and social institutions. Mr. Turner closed the doors of his pharmacy permanently, as did Mr. Bell. The YMC and the Black Barbershop closed, as did several local churches, restaurants, and cafes. Dr. Brown, our doctor and the lawyer, moved east to other sections in the Black Northeast neighborhood. An urban renewal project that shortly followed on the heels of this took everything else, including acres of homes and people who supported the once thriving business and cultural district. The impact was devastating. It wiped out generations of history and culture. And we had all come to this place together because of the countless gestures of hope made by the generations that preceded us the baby born, the family begun, the care and nurturing of our schools, our communities, a wonderful variety of faiths, and of course, our families and their families before them. It happened just like that, without fanfare and without erecting a monument or even a plaque of recognition that would honor what was lost. Such precious memories are our cultural heritage. It was not just buildings and homes that were lost, but something much more important than bricks and mortar. It was the loss of culture, of religious history, of friends, of neighbors, or gathering places like the black barber shop. And the other places that were close by. Places where families raised, where parents raised families and childhood friends socialized and climbed, uh, as I remember, apricot trees or learned to swim at the Y or the pool hall next to my father's gas station where I learned to play pool and dominoes and most important, listen and talk to my black elders like Cool Breeze or Curly or Forrest or Irving about life and growing up black in a hostile world. Such rich and ennobling conversations full of meaning and mystery and purpose and love for me, a black teenage kid trying to make his way in a world that did not always seem hospitable to him and his dreams. All of this was lost, wiped off the face of the planet in the name of convenience and progress. Just like that, gone, all of it gone, in an instant, leaving in its wake human trauma and suffering and personal wreckage. And one asks oneself, why and how did this happen? It's sad to say, but it was because this poor but gorgeous tribal neighborhood was invisible to the planners, invisible to the architects, invisible to the builders, invisible to the government agencies, invisible to the politicians and their misplaced politics. We had no standing. We had no agency. This is a story about people, not highways. In 1916, John Dewey described democracy as the most ethical aspiration conceived by ethical communities. This aspiration was unattainable, he wrote, without a society's commitment to lifelong education to develop the capacities for associated living in a society characterized by complexity and diversity. This is a great American dream that we can create out of the rich diversity of human experience Communities made both beautiful and effective by their pluralism. Not the kind of dream that is available only to those privileged by history or family income or wealthy neighborhoods. Not the kind of dream that is built on narrow self-interest, but rather 
a compelling vision of what we could be if we were truly open to the best that is known and thought in the world, the kind of dream which will swing open wide the doors of opportunity, which sets the table for all to enjoy life's bounty, and which holds our nation's motto, e pluribus unum, out of the many, one, as a living creed. So I want to thank you for listening to me, and thank you even more for your valiant efforts to keep this dream alive in your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody want to ask a question? Also, I recognize that I kept here a long time, so uh, you won't be penalized if you don't have a question. Uh, but if if you do have a question, we should we should keep it we should keep it brief and short. Sure. So we go. Um, so my question is regarding the Boston Foundation. Um, how do you all partner with um, architecture firms or people who, with our background in design to help uh, create this equity that you're talking about? You know, I don't think that we uh, do that in an explicit way, um, but we do do that through, uh, you know, neighborhood programs that we have. We have several business equity uh, programs. These are programs that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, where the owners are uh, folks of color, and we provide uh, funding uh, and loans for those programs without, um, it's essentially free money. And some of those programs are engaged uh, in, in, in these issues. You know, the most important thing we do is civic leadership. It's more important than the money we give away. Uh, and so we speak out on, you know, these issues that I was talking about today. Uh, we speak out on uh, issues like upzoning. Do you know what upzoning is? You probably do, so everybody knows what that is. Um, and uh, one of our um, pillars of uh, excellence, I may, may call it that, where we provide grant funding is, is in housing development and affordable housing in particular, but also workforce development. So, so we do it in those particular ways. But I don't think that we have a a relationship with a particular architectural firm or something like that doesn't mean that we can't. We just haven't had in the past, and I would be happy to talk to you about that, S especially when you own your own firm. So, yeah. so thank you. Just one more question. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for coming and for the lecture and for your beautiful and kind words. I wanted to ask you, as we reflect on uh, humanistic approaches to design, and humanism in, in general. How you, in your work in the Boston Foundation, how do you challenge and at the same time uh, acknowledge the challenges of life, uh, create new structures in order to approach a more humanistic uh, view of how we design or how we, you know, taking care of the community? Yeah. It seems, I mean, it's very easy to overlook when you are like taking care of all, such a huge organization. Right, right. So we just finished a strategic planning process and a strategic vision called Our New Pathways. Uh, and you can, you can go to tbf.org and you'll find it there, uh, and it will answer your question. And you'll, you'll, you'll be able to read a seven or eight page uh, uh, vision statement uh, that answers your question. You'll also be able to read, um, um, we have five core strategies that we're working on, and probably the centerpiece of that is commit to closing racial wealth gaps, uh, because we think that's very important. And so this, we, the, 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 we call this plan our, pa our new pathway, uh, and we use our civic uh, leadership and our resources to repair, which is to acknowledge the harm done, um, and uh, also to build, to build anew. And if you, if you go there, you'll be able to 
see, um, you'll be able to see um, uh, what I'm talking about. Thank you. I'm curious if you've written up the story of what happened to your neighborhood. And if not, you should. And it should become required reading because I know I majored in civil engineering with a focus on urban design. Mm -hmm. And we studied housing complexes that were essentially torn down after they realized they had spent a lot of money and weren't really accomplishing what they wanted to. But I don't remember anything about the impact on hi of highways like that. And I'm just thinking it should be written and distributed and required reading. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, I you know, others have uh, offered that to me. Let me, uh, let me make a, a, a kind of selfish uh, plug here for a book called uh, People Before Highways. It was written by uh, Carolyn Crockett, who's now a, a professor at MIT. Um, and um, I'll just I'll make this short. When I first arrived in Boston, I would drive up to New Hampshire a lot and to get on 95. For the life of me, I never could understand why I just couldn't get on 95 in Boston. But I had to go out here, uh, I guess west, pick up 128, and then get to 95. And then I realized I couldn't get on 95 going south unless I got on 128, or you could also pick it up at 1 and got on 95. So if you look at the map, and I would urge you to do this, you look at the map um, and you'll see that 95 is disrupted. And it was, and it was the history of that disruption is, is, is uh, uh, you know, is, is, is made clear in this book called People Before Highways. Um, and there was an anti-highway movement in this country, and particularly in Boston, was a big, uh, big one. It lasted for several uh, decades. It was multi-general, uh, uh, multi-generational, and multi-racial. Um, and it stopped that highway from coming through. It would have, it would have gone through Roxbury, uh, and uh, would have displaced almost 6,000 homes. Didn't do that. It would have taken, and there is in fact a little plaque, <laughs> you can see it, and Roxbury Crossing, most people don't know it's there, um, but it's, it's a plaque about um, uh, this, um, this victory. And what's the great thing about this book is that it uh, highlights stories of people. Uh, it's all about people, and, and um, there, was a, there was a sign, I guess, that people uh, created in this anti-highway um, marches it said people before highways and that's the title of the book so I'd encourage all of you to read that so I want to thank Dr. Pelton for these amazing stories oh, thank you. and thank words you. and um, you should know that before this lecture I'm the person who runs interference between marketing communications and our esteemed lecture so I'm pinging him every seven or eight days um, Lecture, please. <laughs> Ideas that we can post to the website. Could you please? And now I understand. He was actually going very deep and giving us a very profound conversation where architecture is at the heart of the humanism you presented. I'm very grateful, and I apologize now no, 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 for all the, like, no, no, no. what can I post to the website? No, 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 no. So if you would all give a round of applause for his excellent work.